A young woman who went for a quiet walk in her local park met a stranger who would take her life in a vicious, unprovoked attack and he was only 16 years old. Today's case brings us to County Cork and specifically Cork City, a beautiful place with friendly people. The best way to experience this hilly southern seaport is on foot. The sights and delights of the city can be covered in around 20 minutes. Cork is considered to be a very safe place to live, but unfortunately, crimes and criminals, similar to today's story, have plagued smaller counties and towns alike. This brings us into the background of the Kylie family. Living in Cork City in the year 2000, in the small suburban estate, Ballincollig, John and Rose had married many years previously, and they had four children together, three girls and a boy. And what sets this family apart was their faith. The Keelys were members of the small community of Jehovah's Witnesses, who were in Cork at the time, and it was very important in their family and day-to-day -day life. Their daughter Rachel was involved in the local congression, and she was devoted to her faith. And after leaving secondary school in Bellin College, community college, she began training as a beautician, in part because she knew a career in that sector would leave plenty of time for her to do missionary work with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And this was something she was very passionate about. In the summer of that year, she made a trip to Italy with her sister, where she worked for a short period of time as an au pair. But soon, the two girls returned home. Rachel was known as a sweet, kind and pretty girl and she had a boyfriend who was one of her friends in his Jehovah's Witnesses. Rachel and her family lived a simple, yet happy life. On Thursday the 26th of October 2000, Rachel who was now 22 years old, she left her family to take her two dogs for a walk in the park. She had been studying her Bible that day just before she left, and she had a Bible study meeting that evening to attend. She left her home at about half 4 p.m. and her mother said that she would have her dinner waiting for her when she came back. And about an hour later, Rose heard scratching at the front door of their house, which was very abnormal. And when she looked out their window, she seen her two dogs scraping at the door. But Rachel wasn't there. It was immediately apparent that something was very wrong. Rose and her teenage daughter Elizabeth headed out to the regional park to look for Rachel. Walking along the path that they knew she usually took, but there was no sign of Rachel at all, and it was getting dark. They would have limited time of full visibility. At 7pm that evening, her parents raised the alarm that Rachel was missing. Friends and family would go out searching for her as soon as they heard. And tragically, at around 8pm, a close family friend found Rachel, and she was in some undergrowth far from the walking track in the park. She was lying face down and covered in briars and ferns. And she clearly had been the victim of an attack. The emergency service were notified, but by that stage, there was nothing that they could do. She had been dead on arrival. The Guardi began a murder investigation and the area was sealed off. A Guardi from the Technical Bureau began a thorough examination of the site. Door-to-door -door inquiries began in the houses nearest to the park and it was established that Rachel had been last seen in the park at 5.15. A spokesperson for the core congregation of the Jehovah's Witnesses said they were all numb and devastated by Rachel's sudden and violent death. She had been hugely involved in the church and had planned to take on preaching with them in the future. Flowers and wreaths were laid near to the crime scene and her funeral was set to take place in the Witness Kingdom Hall on Hibernian Road in Cork City on Tuesday the 31st of October. The funeral was attended by most of the 200 fellow Jehovah's Witnesses as well as members of the faith from all over the country. It was led by her uncle Max and she was buried in St. Oliver Cemetery on Saturday the 28th of October. Gardy told the media people who had been in the regional park might have seen something 
that would provide valuable leads in the case. To determine who had attacked Rachel, there were a number of youths questioned in relation to her death, who had been playing football only 200 yards away from where Rachel's body had been found. Guardy were also appealing for anyone who had been in the park that evening between 2pm and 8pm. A post-mortem was completed and it was determined Rachel had died from asphyxiation. But further examinations would be needed to determine if smothering or strangulation had been the cause of her death. Guardy were also trying to establish if a mugging or a sexual assault led to the killing. Rachel was found fully clouded by detectives, but some of them believe her clouding may have been interfered with. Men who had convictions for committing sexual assaults were questioned by the police. Gardy were also looking to speak to an elderly man and a group of teenage girls who were believed to have been in the park just before Rachel had died. CCTV footage around the area were collected, so Gardy could review these too. In November, Gardy began collecting DNA samples from those who were in the area at the time and had stated they had made significant developments on the case. And it was also confirmed Gardy completed door-to-door inquiries, having knocked on 1,000 houses in the surrounding areas, which resulted in over 500 interviews conducted throughout the investigation. On the 7th of November, RTE's Crime Lion, which is a TV show that asks the help of the public to solve a specific crime, broadcast a reconstruction of Rachel's last known movements. And just three days later, news broke that someone had been arrested for questioning in relation to Rachel's death, following DNA results. The 16-year-old male was picked up in Cork City that morning and brought in for questioning. That night, he had been charged with the murder and sexual assault of Rachel Kiley. He could never be named for legal reasons at that time, but it was reported he was from the local Balancholic area. He made no reply and remained in custody until the trial on the 1st of May 2002, with a jury of seven men and five women. During the trial, Rachel's mom Rose took to the stand, and she spoke about looking for her daughter that evening she went missing. She said when searching in the park for Rachel, she walked by the accused 16-year-old and thought about asking him if he had seen her in the area, but she thought she might see him a little bit paranoid, so she didn't. Four young men who had seen the accused on the day were also to give evidence. They said he acted normally. They had all met that evening at about half past six at a friend's and they watched TV. He was just the same person. He was his normal self, watching TV and chatting away. After that, they had all gone to the regional park to go on their motorbikes, but they left shortly after as there was a lot of guardie in the area. They continued on saying he didn't seem on edge or anything. He was just his normal self. A doctor then took to the stand, and he had been at the scene of the crime. He said the position Rachel's body was in was not natural, and suggested Rachel was dragged to where she was found in heavy undergrowth. It looked to him as if she had been placed there, and an effort was made to try hide the body. Semen was found on Rachel's clothing and was consistent with the DNA sample provided by the defendant. She said there was one in 16 billion chance that the DNA might be from someone else. Rachel likely tried to flee her attacker, where she was cornered, then strangled and assaulted. And in defence of the accused 16-year-old boy, his mother and father spoke in court, saying he didn't have anything to do with the horrific crimes that took place that night. They went into the background of their son, saying he left school when he was 14. After the school informed the parents he would be better off. It seemed the school, they couldn't handle him anymore. And finally, the accused 16 year old spoke. He said he knew Rachel to see and he went to school with one of her brothers. He said on the evening of Rachel's death, he called to his girlfriend's workplace and he collected her. He then recalled the guardy visiting his house a week before the murder and they handed him a warning as he was caught dangerous driving on his motorized bike. They said he could do three years in prison if he was caught on his bike again, but he went out on the bike the very next day. He continued on by saying the last time he saw Rachel was a month ago, 
and that he never had any close contact with her. On Tuesday the 18th of June, the seven men and five women returned with their verdict. The defendant was found guilty of Rachel's murder, he was sentenced to life for her murder and for the sexual assault charge, he was sentenced to an additional 10 years. As the accused was now an 18 year old man, the following day after the guilty verdict, Ian Horgan was named in newspapers and news outlets all over Ireland and County Cork. He was the eldest of four children in his family and he had been working in a factory before his arrest. He lived just around the corner from Rachel and shockingly, he had attended her funeral in the days following her murder. Rachel's family were pleased with the decision, but they got no real closure as they had lost their little girl. In January of 2004, Ian Horgan would appeal to the courts. He argued his judge's directions had been misleading and that the jury were not told valuable information regarding forensic science, which would have been in the interest of the defence. The court agreed and Ian Horgan's conviction was overturned. He was then released on bail and a retrial was then ordered which began in February 2006. Ian Horgan pled not guilty to the murder and sexual assault, but he admitted to manslaughter. The jury returned on the 10th of March and this time, Ian Horgan was found guilty of sexual assault, but found not guilty of murder. He was instead convicted of manslaughter. And shockingly, Ian Horgan was given an eight year sentence and six of those years were suspended, leaving him with two years. This came as a massive blow to the family. They felt there was no justice handed down for a daughter and a very lenient sentence was disappointing to say the least. The public were outraged with this and it was an appeal. The prosecutor said the judge put too much weight on the defendant's age, which in turn reflected on the light sentence handed down to Ian. The court of appeals agreed and they said the court is of a view there is a demand that a sexual assault case accompanied with violence which carries a risk of death must be seen as a very serious offence and therefore must attract a sentence in a higher range. The appeals court decided that a 12 year sentence for each charge was more appropriate in this case. Rachel's family were satisfied with the sentence and said nothing will bring their daughter back but the sentence given reflects the crime committed more accurately and Ian Horgan would be sent back to the Midlands prison to serve out the remainder of his years. But this wouldn't be the last time we would see Ian Horgan in front of a judge, as the same year Ian was up in court on the robbery of a post office in 2005. Ian had been out on bail at the time, awaiting the retrial of the murder of Rachel Kiley. He had entered a post office in a rural area in County Cork, and he was armed with a slash hook. The elderly couple who ran the shop opened the door to him and he robbed the place. And when he was leaving, the couple's son arrived. Ian threatened him and stole his car to make a getaway. He made off with 1,500 euro and rolls of a lot of scratch cards. The stolen car was found soon after, along with the slash hook used to rob the post office and a kitchen knife. DNA was found in the car and it linked Ian to the robbery. At the trial he denied any involvement, but the jury found him guilty as charged and sentenced him an additional eight year sentence for this offence. And later he would appeal it. And yes, he won this appeal also. On the grounds the guardy did not have a proper warrant to search his home at the time of the robbery. He got yet another retrial for this and a lesser sentence of four years was handed down. In 2013, Ian was released from prison and he moved in with his girlfriend in County Limerick. He was then arrested again in relation to a shooting in Limerick City. The victim was hit in the chest with shotgun pellets and he survived the attack. When Ian was arrested, he was found with shotgun residue all over his hand, but he said he was shooting in the woods with a friend and he pled not guilty to the offence of possession of a shotgun with the intent to harm. He was found not guilty for this offence but would soon find himself back in prison. He was soon arrested for an armed robbery and given a four year sentence for this. And in 2016, he was released and six months after his release, drugs were found in his home after a search and he was linked to another armed robbery. In 2018, 
he would appear in court for the drugs found in his home and he was sentenced to two years and three months for this. Then in December of 2018, he was in court in relation to the robbery he was accused of. Six months after his release, he pled guilty and he received a six year sentence with two suspended. And Ian was unfortunately released from prison in 2021 to continue committing his crimes. Soon after he was released, he made a Tinder account with an alias name, which could have misled to an unsuspecting person to meeting Ian without knowing his background and horrific crimes. He also attacked a man with a hammer, leaving him with serious head injuries. He was arrested for this, where he remains in custody awaiting his trial in June 2023. Ian Horgan, who is now 38, he spent 16 years of his life behind bars and he racked up a staggering 17 previous convictions over the years. It's safe to say Limerick, Cork and the whole of Ireland would benefit with him kept behind bars. But unfortunately, this is not how the judicial system works in Ireland. And we'll have to wait and see the fate of Ian Horgan. I will keep you all updated on the court proceedings in the community section. Thoughts go out to the many victims that suffered at the hands of Ian Horgan, especially the family of Rachel Kiley. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one.